Hello and welcome to lecture 12. This is our final lecture where we'll be looking at multiplexing. So in our last two lectures we looked at digital modulation, we looked at digital baseband modulation which was the same as pulse modulation. We talked about digital bandpass modulation which is um, carrier based wireless communication. In our final lecture, we want to say a few words about multiplexing. So this is a really short lecture. It shouldn't be more than around 20 minutes. Now, all of these lectures, starting from lecture 7 until this lecture 12, these are included in the class test on the 12th of May. So a quick recap. In lecture 11, we spoke, to, we spoke about digital bandpass modulation. So that's basically amplitude modulation, frequency modulation, and phase modulation. We spoke about how to generate it, how to detect it, and a little bit about what the frequency domain representation looks like. We spoke about different variants of these. And we said, really, in essence, it's just the same as AM, FM and PM that we're familiar with. The only difference is that the information, instead of being an analog signal, it's a line code generated from a digital signal. Now, before we start today's lecture about multiplexing, just a few words about the class test. So, a few things you need to know. Number one, it's worth 15%. This is your second class test. Number two, it's scheduled for 10 o'clock on Wednesday the 12th. That's the only time it'll be available, so if you can't make it for that time, you need to let me know um, why that is and if you're entitled to a claim for extenuating circumstances, then you need to make that um, sooner rather than later. Lectures 7 to 12 are included in the test, and the test comes in two parts, A and B. Part A contains 10 questions at 7.5 marks each, and part B is 5 questions with 5 marks each. There's roughly an hour allocated to each of these sections, so section A starts at 10 o'clock and closes at 11. And part B is available from 10 o'clock until 12 o'clock. Okay, so you've got uh, two hours in total. Now, part B involves handwritten solutions, so rather than answering online, you might need to provide a sketch, write something out mathematically, or provide some um, explanation or an answer that's written. So these are, these are, this is a different format to what you're um, familiar with. So I do strongly suggest you spend a few minutes looking at the online demo. So it isn't a practice test, but it's a demo for part B. So that's for the class test. For today's lecture, we're going to introduce the idea of multiplexing. Multiplexing in the time domain, multiplexing in the frequency domain, and a combination of the two, which we refer to as sp spread spectrum. Okay, so you're going to see this symbol here, MUX, representing a multiplexing um, or a multiplexor, and DMUX, representing a demultiplexer. But before that, before we get stuck into today's topic, I want to say a few words about performance. So when we're talking about a digital 
system where rather than talking about signal to noise ratio we're often interested in errors an error is a one that's transmitted that's received as a zero or a zero that's received sorry uh, transmitted and received as a one both of these are considered errors so this is what we want to avoid in communications we want to avoid a situation where the um, transmitted signal and the received signal aren't the same so that's how we generally um, quantify the performance of a digital system so we use something called the bit error rate and by rate we mean what proportion of the total bits transmitted are received in error so the number of bits received in error divided by the total number of bits transmitted or received that's your bit error rate so ideally ideally we would want the bit error rate to be zero okay that means there'd be no bits received in error now that's an ideal situation and that never really happens we have to accept that there's always going to be a bit error rate but to compare different communication systems it's useful to be able to compare their bit error rates and this isn't just a single number but rather it's a behavior or a, a bit error rate curve so if we were to plot the bit error rate against signal to noise ratio so here the um, uh, horizontal axis is signal to noise ratio so here we have low SNR and here we have high SNR low SNR means we have a lot of noise compared to the signal high SNR means we have very little noise compared to the signal and again the vertical axis is decreasing bit error rate so that means that down here we have a low bit error rate and up here we have high bit error rate so what we want is something that has a low bit error rate so ideally we would want to be as low down here as possible and as far to the left of po as possible even though it says low SNR we want to be able to get the best possible bit error rate with the lowest possible signal to noise ratio so if we compare these two curves so we've got two communication systems a and b now if we wanted to compare them solely on the basis of their bit error rate performance then it looks like for a given signal to noise ratio a will give a lower bit error rate than b so we can say a gives a better bit error rate performance than B at a given SNR. Why do we need to say at a given SNR? Because B can achieve the same bit error rate as A, it just needs less noise or a higher SNR. So this is how we compare uh, communication systems. So for example, remember QAM we looked at in lecture 10? So you can have different levels of QAM. You can have um, two level QAM, 16 level QAM, 64 level QAM, and all of these are represented on this same plot and again what we have here is signal to noise ratio what we have here is bit error rate so 
here we have low bit error rate. And here we have high bit error rate. Now, if you look at that, that's a one. That means everything is received in error. So that is the most um, undesirable situation. And here you've got zero. So this is the most desirable situation where we have no errors at all. So you can see that as the signal to noise ratio increases, as you get less and less noise, you get lower bit error rate. But at a given signal to noise ratio, it looks like 64 calm has a much higher error rate than 2 calm. Why is that? Why do you think that as we increase the number of um, um, the number of uh, symbols encoded, we're also increasing the bit error rate. So if you just simplify this and think solely of the amplitudes, if we only use two amplitudes compared to a situation where we have, so if we have two amplitudes within our, our range of, say, five volts, compare that to a situation where you have multiple levels in the same in the same voltage range so if we if that was 5 volts and that was 5 volts then clearly here if you were if you needed to detect between these different levels you would need a much more accurate um, sampling uh, circuit so therefore the effect of noise on this will be much greater than the effect of noise on that. So imagine if instead of having um, four levels, we had 64 levels. So that consists of phase and amplitude. But also think about the phase. If you have multiple phase shifts, then the effect of noise will be more pronounced. So you see that two quam is much better in terms of bit error rate, but less good in terms of throughput, i.e. Um, you can encode fewer symbols, and therefore it's a slower communication. And the opposite is also true, so 64 cam is much faster than 2 quam, but much more errors. How do we get around that? Well, you need to you need to go down this curve until you get to a level that you do accept. So that means higher signal to noise ratio, less noise. So it is possible for these to have the same bit error rate um, performance or the same bit error rate, but you would just need different signal to noise ratios. Okay, here's a, a question similar to a question I asked in an exam a few years ago. So we, we, we're given this plot that's comparing different digital modulation formats. Again, it's the familiar bit error rate on the vertical axis, where here we have everything in error, and here we have low bit error rates. So I'll just write that out to make it clear. And the horizontal axis is signal to noise ratio in decibels. So the question is, how much more likely is a bit received via ASK to be erroneous, that means in error, compared to DPSK? So DPSK, that's this one here. ASK, that's this one here. Sorry, no, DPSK is the red line. That's DPSK. So it says at an SNR of 9 decibels, 
if you look at nine decibels, which is right here, and you draw a vertical line upwards, then you have these two points that you're interested in. So that corresponds to 10 to the minus 2 and 10 to the minus 4. So 10 to the minus 2, that means 1 in every 100 bits. Every 1 in 100 bits is in error. And here, that means every 1 in 10 thousand bits is in error so clearly this is much better because you have fewer errors but the question is how much more how much better or how much more likely is that to give you an error so how much worse is ASK remember ASK is this blue line so how much worse so the answer is, it's just the quotient of those two, just divide those. So you either divide 10 to the minus 2 divided by 10 to the minus 4, or you divide 10,000 by 100. The answer is the same. It's 100 times more likely. So if you receive one bit, you're 100 times more likely for that bit to be an error if you used ASK compared to DPSK. How do we know that? We know that from the graph. We wouldn't have known it without the graph. So, back to today's lecture. The topic is multiplexing. And multiplexing, all it really means is having several communication channels share the same channel. So several communication signals sharing the same channel. Demultiplexing is the opposite. It's recovering the original signals from the multiplex signal. It's because the channel is always in, in high demand. OK, so think of, of something that's in high demand. You've got lots of users all wanting to use it. So multiplexing is just a way in which the channel can be shared so that multiple simultaneous data streams can use the same channel at the same time. So we can do that in different ways. But in general, just think of it as you've got multiple sources, multiple parties wanting to communicate. So source one, destination one, source two, destination two, etc. So you can have multiple parties wanting to communicate. But there aren't multiple channels. You don't have lots and lots of cables. And this is particularly true in wireless communication, but it's also true in baseband and wired communication. So you have a multiplexer and you have a demultiplexer. And what, what that allows, it allows controlled access to the channel. Either by dividing up the frequency available or dividing up the time available. So just to get a, a little bit of terminology out of the way, when we talk about transmission protocol, we either speak about a one-way communication system or a two-way communication system. Now, the two-way communication system can either happen at the same time or it can happen asynchronously, so not simultaneously. So an example of a simplex system, as we call it, a simplex system is a one-way communication system. It's like um, radio. So you've got a transmitter and you've got a receiver. You can't transmit from the receiver 
all you can do is receive. So it's one-way communication. Two-way communication, we call that duplex. It can either be half duplex or full duplex. Half duplex is where one party is communicating at a time. So you've got a transmitter and a receiver at one point in time. And then when that stops, then the other party can transmit and the original party will receive. So that's what you're probably familiar with with a walkie-talkie system where one person is talking, finishes, over, the next person can speak, they finish, and they say over. Each of them will have to press the PTT button, press to talk. They'll press that button when they want to talk. So it's called a half duplex system. A full duplex system is where you have two-way communication. You don't have to press a button. You don't have to signal indicating that you've finished speaking by saying over. You simply have a two-way communication system where both parties are talking at the same time. So that's like a, um, a, a telephone where you have a transmitter and a receiver and the transmitter can receive and the receiver can transmit. So, when we talk about multiplexing, as I said, we can either divide up the frequency, and that's called FDM, or we can talk about um, dividing up the uh, time, and that's called TDM. And generally, time division multiplexing refers to digital multiplexing, and frequency division multiplexing is analog. Or a better way of saying that is analog signals um, benefit from uh, frequency division multiplexing and digital signals benefit from time division multiplexing. That's probably a better way of saying it. So frequency division multiplexing, we've spoken about that. We didn't use the word multiplexing, but when we spoke about radio, um, radio stations sharing the frequency uh, channel and adjacent radio stations and guard bands, etc. That's all examples of frequency division multiplexing, where different um, channels can share the same, um, uh, can transmit and receive at the same time because they don't overlap in the frequency domain. Something similar happens in the time domain, and it's very common for fiber optic communications and telephone communications where time is subdivided into little slots because we have a, a sampling process and a digitization process so um, you can have multiple transmissions all happening um, I want to say at the same time but it's not at the same time they happen simultaneously but the um, the, uh, the bits and the packets they don't overlap in time. Now if we combine time and frequency division multiplexing we have something called spread spectrum. And we see that in, in things like Bluetooth and Wi-Fi. We'll look at that in a second. So if you imagine each of these colored bands is a different user, so user 1, user 2, user 3, user 4, in frequency division multiplexing, all four users are using the channel all of the time, at the same time, but they're each allocated a different frequency band. So the blue user has this frequency band, the pink user has this frequency band, and because they're different bands, they don't overlap, and therefore they can transmit at the same time. So this could be a radio station. So that's your blue. And this could be, um, the pink could be a radio station too. I'll call it radio station four. 
And they can be broadcasting all of the time, at the same time, but because they each have their own frequency range, then they don't overlap, and therefore um, they don't interfere. So they've shared the wireless, the wireless electromagnetic propagation channel that exists in the city. They're all transmitting at the same time, and different receivers can receive them at the same time. Now, for time division multiplexing, the opposite happens. They all use all of the same frequency uh, axis, but they're all given individual slots, individual periods of time where they can transmit. And these are very short slots. So what we're doing is we're exploiting the redundancy that exists within your signal. So remember, we spoke about redundancy before. So when you sample an analog signal, you are exploiting something called the redundancy. So you're only sampling several times um, a second. So between these samples, nothing's happening. So you have a, a, a value here that's converted into digital. You have a value here that's converted into digital. You have a value here. You have a value here. But what's happening here? What's happening in the period of time between samples? Well, the answer is nothing's happening. So that gives you time to sample another signal. So there might be another signal that could be sampled at this time, at the time when nothing else is happening. And that could be converted to digital, that could be converted to digital, that could be converted to digital. And if these streams are combined together, that gives us these slots. So each of these is a slot. Slot A, slot B, slot A, slot B, slot A, slot B. So that's time division multiplexing. So another illustration of um, frequency division multiplexing. Again, we're not talking about baseband. These have to these have to be modulated. There has to be band pass. Okay. So why do they need to be modulated? Because without modulation, they wouldn't have their own frequency band. They'd all be at base band, but these have clearly been modulated, so they, they all have their own frequency ranges. So channel one, channel two, channel three. When they're at base band, they're all low frequency, right? So they all start from zero and they end uh, similar ranges. So if these are all... I don't know that one. So if these are all audio, then they'll all have some low kilohertz bandwidth. So these are your baseband messages. After modulation, each of them will have a center frequency and will have an upper and a lower frequency. And if they're placed on the frequency axis in such a way that they either don't overlap or very slightly overlap, or they have guard bands in between them, in, I, in all these cases, we call this frequency division multiplexing. So what they're doing is they're sharing the same channel at the same time. So if we want to avoid overlap, then the bandwidth of the medium must be at least n, where n is the number of users, times the bandwidth of the signal. Now, if we want to introduce guard bands in between 
our users, then we're going to have to add the guard bands here. So frequency division multiplexing is often used in uh, telephone lines, for radio stations we've already spoken about, and for television. So you've seen this um, illustration before where you have your frequency, um, the electromagnetic spectrum, the frequency spectrum, and you can see that different things are happening on the same spectrum at different regions, but they're all happening at the same time. So this is, just looking at this, this is an example of frequency division multiplexing, where you have satellite communication and radio communication all happening at the same time, but they're happening at different frequencies. So again, a little illustrated example. So you've got these three users. They're all using the same frequency band from 0 to 4 kilohertz. So they can't share the same channel at the same time because you'd have interference between the two, between the three. So what we do is we modulate. So we increase the frequency. So we've added 20 kilohertz here, we add 24 kilohertz here, and we add 28 kilohertz here. That way, they can sit next to each other on the, chan on the uh, frequency spectrum. So obviously, this is frequency. So here, once they arrive at the receiver, you'll need some kind of a filter. What kind of a filter? Well, it's going to be a band pass filter. You're going to need a band pass filter at the receiver. And you'll need three of these. One to filter out the first, one for the second, one for the third. And here, each receiver will receive the corresponding message from the original transmitter. So that, that's how FDM works in practice. Now, time division multiplexing, as I said, it's similar, but you need to think about it, or you, you can visualize it as a rotating switch. So you have a, a switch which rotates. So when it's, when it's in this position, connecting conversation A or message A, then the other corresponding switch with the synchronized demultiplexer, because these have to be in sync, will give you conversation A. So this party will be communicating with this party. And that is, let's say, your sample here. So this slot here might correspond to what we just drew. The next time slot the switch might move to position B at the multiplexer. 
and position B at the demultiplexer. So you would, your sampler would then sample the second message, and then you would be looking at the next slot. And again, yeah, that slot would, through multiplexing and demultiplexing, then manifest itself here as your second sample. So effectively, you have a interleaved multiplexed set of samples here, which are these slots, which are demultiplexed here. And what you end up with after recovery is your original signals. Now, if your original signals were digital, then these will be digital. If your original signals were analog, then you'll need both a sampling circuit here and a recovery signal here or reconstruction signal here. Important to note that time division multiplexing doesn't involve a carrier. So we're talking about the baseband signal because we're sampling, if, it, if it's analog, we're sampling it. If it's digital, then it's baseband already. But the bit rate of the medium is greater than the data rate of the signal. So you can imagine that if we had one kilobit per second here, each of these was one kilobit per second, then what would the data rate here be? It would be four times one kilobit per second. Because every second you have a thousand bits generated by this first user. Another thousand bits generated by this, another thousand, another thousand. So basically you have four thousand bits being generated every second. And all of these are sharing the same channel, the same fiber optic cable, the same ethernet cable, the same medium. So therefore, you will have a bit rate, which is a multiple of the um, bit rates of the, uh, the users. Finally, last thing we want to talk about is something called spread spectrum. Now, spread spectrum is a combination of time domain multiplexing and frequency domain multiplexing. Now, this is something that we see in Bluetooth communications, in Wi-Fi, and in mobile communications, in GSM, and it's it's a more secure kind of communication where your transmitter and receiver agree on a particular dance, a particular code, where at any particular time, each user has a different frequency. So, for example, at this point in time, one user has this frequency, another user has this frequency, and another user has this frequency. A moment later, the blue signal has hopped onto a higher frequency. The orange signal has hopped down to a lower frequency. And the green signal has hopped down to a much lower signal, a frequency. So with time, you see each channel or each signal, each user, each link is hopping from frequency to frequency. That's why we call it frequency hopping. So basically we spread the spectrum over the entire frequency axis. So if you were to look only at the blue, only look at the blue and think about its spectrum, its spectrum here looks like it's there, but its spectrum here is there, its spectrum here is there. So if you were to just look at the spectrum and think how that might look, 
that's your frequency axis. Then the spectrum for the blue would look something like this. Now the spectrum for the green would be similar. The spectrum for the green might look something like that. And the spectrum for the orange might look something like that. So it looks like all three users are using the same frequency spectrum. How is that possible? How is it possible that they're using the same frequency spectrum? Well, it's because they're not using it at the same time. So at any point in time, they're not overlapping. So that's why they call it a spread spectrum technique, because we spread the spectrum over the entire frequency axis. So it's almost impossible to um, uh, intercept and to distort the signal. It's impossible. So you've got a transmitter and you've got a receiver, and it's impossible for a man in the middle to actually recover the original message without knowing what the um, what the code is between them. That's why Bluetooth is relatively secure. So there are a few, a couple of brief YouTube clips I want to share with you, just to show you a few of these things in practice. It's less than a minute uh, long. Here you can see in the top plot, that's a spectral plot, you can see the center frequency is changing with time. Okay, anyone who wants to know what extreme hopping looks like for uh, the EZUHF, So center frequency is uh, 440 megahertz. So left of the grid is 430, right of the grid is 450 megahertz. And there's your spread, spread spectrum. So that was spread spectrum, sometimes abbreviated as SS. So we use codes to be able to, um, to, to, to achieve this um, frequency hopping. You might come across something called CDMA, Code Division Multiple Access. And that just means that we use the, we use the codes. So the, the C in CDMA is for codes. It just means we use the codes to actually achieve this, um, this multiplexing. So direct sequence, the, 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 these are abbreviations you might come across. But where will you use this? You have all used this before. So you've used Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, you've definitely used uh, cellular communications. All of these are forms of frequency hopping spread spectrum techniques. So they are multiplexing. So they're combinations of time division and frequency division multiplexing. And you'll be pleased to hear that this is our final slide. That's the end of the module. We are right here. Okay, so we've just finished our final lecture. If you enjoyed that, if you think communications um, uh, is something you want to look at further, then look into ELEC 377 or ELEC 477. So, that's all about digital communication, so digital and wireless. So when we speak about wireless communications, therefore we are talking about band pass communications. When we talk about digital, well, we're talking about digital. So it's really the latter part of this module. So lecture 11 and lecture 12, all of that will be... Um, Sub the topic of uh, Dr. Zhu's uh, 
ELEC 377. She looks at noise, she looks at bit error rates, she looked at multi-user communications, all of these concepts in great mathematical depth um, in your third or fourth year. If you're not interested in that, you will be interested in the exam. So the exam is on the 19th of May. So that's not long from now. You need to know a few things about the exam. Everyone will have a different set of questions. Okay, so you won't all be sitting the same test. You all have different questions. You need to answer four questions, but you don't get a choice of which questions to answer. So which questions to answer will depend on your student ID number. Instructions are given on the exam paper. But what you need to do is follow the instructions. So in this case here, you're asked to look at the last two digits of your student ID number and add those digits together. That'll give you something called an exam identifier. And then from the exam identifier, so for example, if, if that's your student ID number and you add five and four together and you get nine, then your exam identifier is nine. You need to write that at the top of your paper. So that is the column you're interested in because your exam identifier is nine. So that means you answer question two, you answer question five, you answer question three, and you answer question seven. You don't answer question one, you don't answer question four, you don't answer question six, you don't answer question eight. And when you do answer question two, you get the parameters, the numbers, from here. So if if question um, uh, two was about modulation, and they asked for they asked you to use the modulation index, you would use the parameter, the number that you got from the table. So this table is there to tell you which questions to answer and what parameters to use, what values to use. Okay. So there will be questions that ask you to design something, to explain, to compare, to contrast, to discuss. There will be several questions asking you to sketch or to plot. Okay, No questions will be straight from the lecture notes. There won't be a single question where copying from the lecture notes will do you any good. That doesn't mean it's a difficult exam, it just means that the exam won't be asking you to copy things from the lecture notes because you'll all have the lecture notes in front of you. So I will reward creativity and um, there will be some scope to use your imagination and to... to um, so I expect you, many different responses, all of which could be correct. So there can be many different correct answers to the same question. Some questions are numeric, in which case there won't be more than one correct answer, but several questions will be open to interpretation. Okay, it won't be a difficult exam. It won't be as hard as the signals exam was last semester, but it, the exam won't look like um, your problem sheets. So I suggest you look closely at last year's exam paper because that was open book and you look at um, the uh, mock exam because there will be a mock exam uh, released um, on Canvas and you're, I, I encourage you to look at the, the style of the questions in the mock exam. Okay, so that's it. That, that's the end of, um, of this module. So well done for making it. I hope you've enjoyed it. If you haven't enjoyed it, I hope you've at least found it useful. I have really um, enjoyed uh, teaching you. It's just been so frustrating that we haven't been able to meet. Um, so uh, 
I hope at least I can meet you all next year. So next year I'll be teaching ELEC 352. So I'll be, um, I'll be seeing you all next year. So good luck in your revision. Good luck in your class test. Good luck for your exams. And stay safe.